my name is Phil Trella, and I am the Associate Vice Provost for Graduate and Postdoctoral Affairs, and I direct the University's Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Affairs. And it is my great pleasure to invite you to our 10th annual Graduate Thesis Slam at the University of Virginia. It's hard to believe that it has been 10 years since we started this program, and although we've initiated some small changes around the edges, it is still one of our favorite programs in which we all get to learn about the amazing research and scholarship of eight finalists who have earned this, the distinction of being on the stage in front of you today. I like to think of it as by far the most exciting and enlightening 24 minutes of each and every year. So what is the Grad Thesis Slam? For those of you who haven't seen this before, or who haven't been part of it before, the Grad Thesis Slam is a competition, an academic competition, um, in which students come to gather to describe their dissertation research within three minutes or less to a general audience. The Grad Thesis Slam celebrates the scholarship and discoveries made by all of our doctoral students across all fields and encourages them to communicate the essence and substance of their work to the broader community. Why do we do this? We do this in part because it is our mission to not only discover, but to disseminate knowledge, to communicate bo both within and across and beyond our disciplines, extending knowledge to the broader community that depends on us and supports us. <clears throat> we do it as part of our ongoing desire to open the PhD more generously to society. And we do it because it's a lot of fun, and because there are prizes. Um, now, while we focus today on these eight amazing finalists, I'd like to remind everyone that this culminating event is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we started uh, this program months ago with workshops and trainings and practice sessions and research communication and a robust preliminary round of presentations that have led us here to listen to these eight extraordinary talks, which you will begin to hear in just a few minutes. Now, with our broader goals laid out, um, each of our, our finalists, I'm gonna talk about some of the specifics about the way that this works. Each of our eight finalists, I'm not going, going to go into all the details, but they will be judged on a couple of broad criteria. The first is comprehension and content, and the second is engagement and communication. I'm gonna advance the slide here. So here are the eight finalists that we will have talking today in the order of their presentations and a rough agenda of the way that this will work. We're going to be judging them in comprehension and content and engagement and communication. I am especially grateful to our four judges who have joined us today, um, coming from as far away as at Atlanta, Georgia, Council of Graduate Schools in Washington, DC, and the University Library, and all the way from engineering. So I wanna welcome them today and say a few words about each of them. I will introduce them in the order um, uh, from, from my left to right, um, in which they are seated at the table. So the first is Ansley Abraham. Ansley is the director of the SREB uh, State Doctoral Scholars Program. Uh, Ansley is the founding director of the SREB Doctoral Scholars Program, which was founded in 1993. Under his direction, the Doctoral Scholars Program has developed into a nationally recognized program for producing minority PhDs who seek faculty careers. The program hosts the annual Institute on Teaching and Mentoring, the largest gathering of minority PhD scholars in the nation. He earned a BS, MS, and PhD in sociology and psychology from Florida State University. Ansley, would you mind standing for just a second and waving to our crowd here? <laughs> Thank you, Ansley. Thank you, Ansley, for joining us. We, we count him for sure among our great friends um, in the networks that, that, we, um, that we engage in. Um, our next judge is Rosalind Byrne. Rosalind is the Anne Shirley Carter Olson Professor of Applied Ethics. She's the chair of the Department of Engineering and Society, and she's the director of the Online Ethics Center for Engineering and Science in the School of Engineering and Applied Science here at UVA. Um, as an ethics scholar, Dr. Byrne explores the intersecting realms of emerging technologies, science, fiction, and myth, and the links between the moral, human, and non-human worlds. She has published several academic books, including Nanotalk Conversations with Scientists and Engineers about Ethics, Meaning, and Belief in the Development of Nanotechnology, and Creating Life from Life, Biotechnology and Science Fiction, as well as other award-winning books in the genres of both fiction and body, mind, spirit. Um, Dr. Byrne, if you wouldn't mind standing. Thank you. 
Our next judge is Amy Scott from the Council of Graduate Schools. Amy is the Associate Vice President for Government Relations and Public Policy Development. Amy has served as the Associate VP for Government Relations and Public Policy for the Council of Graduate Schools since July of 2021. In this role, she provides support and leadership to CGS on public policy, issues impacting graduate education um, specifically. Uh, Ms. Scott leads the development and implementation of CGS's federal policy agenda and represents CGS in the higher education community in Washington, D.C.-based scientific coalitions. Prior to joining CGS, Amy served as, as Associate Vice President for the Association of American Universities and co-chaired the Coalition for National Science Funding, a coalition that advocates for NSF funding, and the Compete America Coalition, a coalition that advocates for immigration reform. Amy, thanks for joining us today. If you wouldn't mind standing, I would appreciate it. And our final judge to introduce today is our own John Onsworth. John Onsworth is the Dean of UVA Libraries, University Librarian, and Professor of English, and great friend of grad students, I might add. Uh, John Onsworth received his PhD in English from UVA in 1988. He taught English at North Carolina State before returning to UVA in 1993 to run the Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities and to teach in the English department. From 2003 to 2012, he was Dean of the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And from 2012 to 2016, he was Vice Provost and University Librarian and CIO at Brandeis University before returning to us back here in Charlottesville in 2016. John. Thank you to all of our, our judges for taking the time to do this. It means a lot to, to have your support. And I think as you heard their bios, you can understand why we were so eager to have them join us today to be judges of our amazing graduate students. Now, as we set out to get started, I am very pleased at this point to introduce and turn things over to two of my colleagues, uh, Sam Lake and Kelly Oman, both of whom serve on our team as assistant directors for research communication. Not only are we at UVA very fortunate to have two, two people serving in such roles, but we are especially fortunate that those two people are, Cam, are Sam and Kelly specifically, or as I call them, Cam. Um, um, they have done an amazing job since starting their, since starting their roles just under a year ago, uh, leading all of our programs in research communication and really bringing to fruition the program that you're going to see today. Um, and if you have the opportunity to meet them, uh, after, the, after the program, I'm confident that after the next 30 minutes or so, you will share my assessment of their, of their sheer awesomeness. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, turn things over to Sam, who will begin by introducing our first speaker for the afternoon. Thank you. It's my honor to introduce our first presenter of today, Valerie Michaels. She is a PhD candidate in Systems Engineering and School of Engineering and Applied Science and will be presenting and sharing her research today, Rising Tides, Rising Inequalities. Imagine waking up to the sound of water splashing against your doorstep, knowing that means the streets are flooded and it might be hours if not days before you get to your work or school or the hospital. This is the reality of Eastern Virginia, where sea level rise is causing repeated daily flooding. But who's left most vulnerable? People who have nowhere to go, those who have been systemically marginalized. With a historically vulnerable population, Norfolk makes an excellent case study for how to incorporate social equity into coastal climate change adaptation planning. So my research question, how do we plan for climate change with the intention of environmental justice? As a systems engineer, I like to take a holistic perspective using mixed methods to incorporate different complex problems. We interviewed over 40 influential stakeholders in Norfolk's coastal adaptation system, including nonprofits, uh, academics, and government. So I'd like to bring up three major points. First is urban heat. So excessive heat on average creates more deaths than flooding, lightning, tornadoes, and hurricanes combined. Using spatial analysis, we were able to look at the connection between urban heat and historical discrimination in housing from redlining. This is due to a lack of tree canopy development in those areas. 
Second is that those historical inequities have cultural implications. So adaptation solutions like managed retreat that require resident participation might need sensitivity to the fact that those communities experience distrust in government interventions. Finally, gentrification. Green infrastructure is great, but it also increases property values and drives out low-income residents. So it needs to be paired with affordable housing options. So how do we actually address some of these issues? Will you incorporate the people that are most affected? So using a feedback system, you can actually meet the needs of a community by using adaptation plans that address their specific needs. Also using qualitative and quantitative assessments in order to understand the specific cultural and social implications of a specific locality. So finally, the future of my research is regional coordination. That means I don't want what I'm doing here to impact my neighbor over there. So I say plan locally, coordinate regionally, and make the state pay for it. Hello, I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Zoe Robertson. Zoe is a fourth year studying developmental psychology in the Jaswell lab led by Dr. Vikram Jaswell. Uh, the title of her presentation today is There's Something Missing in Their Brains, The Development of Autism Dehumanization. Imagine hearing a doctor say that you are missing a core aspect of what it means to be human. Or imagine that a psychologist told you that helping you is like constructing a person. Now imagine hearing those kinds of messages over and over from healthcare professionals, teachers, and maybe even your own parents, and you might have an idea of how autistic people feel. This quote, taken directly from the pioneer of one of the most influential autism therapies to date, is just one example of how autistic people are constantly described with dehumanizing messages, or messages that portray them as less than fully human. Obviously, these messages affect autistic people, but they affect non-autistic listeners as well. In fact, non-autistic children might be particularly influenced by the dehumanizing ways that adults talk about autism. If they don't know anything about autism yet, how do these kinds of messages affect what they think about their autistic peers? And can it lead them to view their peers as less than fully human? Over the past year and a half, I've met with hundreds of kids over Zoom to answer those exact questions. In the Zoom calls, I tell kids a story about two different characters representing two different groups that share common characteristics of autistic people. But I describe one of the groups with the kinds of dehumanizing messages that, based on existing research, kids might already hear about their autistic peers. For example, that they're missing something in their brains, or that they can't understand other people. I describe the other character with humanizing language, for example, that their brains are just different from other kids, and it might look like they don't understand other people even when they do. Then, after the stories, I ask kids to rate the groups on established dehumanization skills like this one. So basically, I'm asking them to explicitly rate how human the groups are. Across multiple studies, I find that kids think the group described with dehumanizing language is less than fully human, that they should be educated in separate classrooms, mm -hmm and that they're less able to make their own decisions about how they live their lives. While these results should be obvious, they show that dehumanizing messages like the ones on the screen are not just words, but that they can negatively affect how people are viewed and subsequently treated. I want everyone who's listening today to carefully consider the ways that you talk about people who are different from yourselves, and to reflect on ways that you can move away from dehumanizing messages towards more humanizing ones, informed by the ways that autistic people view and describe themselves. It's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Abigail Graham from the Chemistry Department and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Her presentation is titled, How Does the Brain Work? One in six people in the world suffer from diseases that affect the brain. One in six. 
When I was growing up, my first one in six observation was my grandfather when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We were able to visit him monthly, and each month I saw a bit of his memory being taken away by this unforgiving disease. Not only Alzheimer's, but diseases like schizophrenia, Parkinson's, and migraines are so debilitating because they affect the way information transfer happens in the body. My research focuses on three proteins that act as these little machines to allow information transfer to occur in the building blocks of our brain. These proteins have names that are quite complex, so I'll be referring to them as machines. When these machines interact, a message is released. This process happens over and over until the message reaches its intended target, allowing our brain to function. This phenomenon is occurring constantly in our bodies, and it allows us to do things like think, dream, and love. Scientists have studied this topic for many years, but they cannot agree on the order in which these three interact. I believe we must define the order of interactions before we can fully understand diseases that affect information transfer in the brain. My dissertation aims to clear up this confusion by taking a very detailed and careful approach. In my work, I attach a special label onto the machine. That label gives me information on what the machine looks like at the position I have placed the label. Through this work, I have been able to identify that one of the machines is likely interacting with the others in two unique steps. Therefore, this finding provides a possible explanation to some of the conflicting data that has been published in this field. It is my hope that my research, combined with the hard work of many others, will help make one in six go to one in 600. Thank you. Okay, up next we have Abba Bessler Gaker, who is from the Department of Psychology. She's a fifth year studying developmental psychology. The title of her presentation today is Autism and Autonomy. Autism, as you may know, is a lifelong condition. Autistic people, like the person in color on the slide here, differ from those around them in the way they interact and communicate with the world. Over the years, several treatments have come up proposing to reduce the severity of this difference. The one I'm going to tell you about today is a particularly disturbing one. Since 1990, the Judge Rotenberg Center an institution for autistic individuals has been using contingent skin shock to control the behavior of some of their students. When these students do something they shouldn't, they receive an electric shock. Now, this is something the UN calls torture, and yet today it is legal in the United States. So what explains this? Why is treatment that we don't condone for convicts and animals considered okay for autistic people? Maybe the answer lies in some common perceptions and attitudes towards autistic people. Hold on to your seats, because this story will take a few turns. My initial thought was that maybe people believe that autistic people just don't feel that much pain. That's why they're unfazed when uh, painful treatments are proposed for autistic people. So in my early studies, I introduced participants to a fictitious autistic or a non-autistic character. Let's call her Taylor and ask them how much pain Taylor would feel if she, say, bumped her knee or got a paper cut. And to my surprise, in study after study after study, participants seemed to think that the autistic Taylor would feel more pain than the non-autistic Taylor. And that was puzzling, because if people believe that autistic people feel a lot of pain, why are they willing to subject them to pain? So then I considered another possibility. Maybe people believe that autistic people are vulnerable just not very capable of controlling their own lives. And since they cannot control their own lives, maybe somebody else should be doing it for them. So next, I introduced participants to the same two characters as before, autistic and non-autistic Taylor, accomplished college students, and asked them who should be taking decisions about Taylor's life. Should it be Taylor or her parents? And as I expected, participants were likely to say that the non-autistic Taylor should be taking her own decisions. 
but they were more likely to say that the autistic Taylor's parents should be taking her decision. So people believe that autistic people feel pain and yet believe that they deserve less autonomy. Even the most sympathetic attitudes towards autistic people can come laced with a shadow of control. My hope is that by illuminating these paternalistic attitudes, we can create a world that is more respectful of autistic people. Thank you. I'm excited to introduce our fifth presenter today, Josh Danoff in the Department of Psychology in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Josh is presenting, How Our Fathers Shape Our Brains and Behavior. I want you all to think about your parents and how they have helped shape you into who you became and how your life might have turned out differently if you had different parents or even one fewer parent. This is the central question of my research. How do our parents shape our brain development? And though I'm interested in how this happens in humans, I use an animal model to study this more molecularly in the brain. I use these critters called prairie voles, which are really interesting because unlike other neuroscience models like mouse or rat, these guys are biparental, meaning both mom and dad help take care of the pups just like human parents do. And what normal parenting looks like for a prairie vole might be a little bit different than humans, but they do the same sorts of nurturing behaviors, so they'll provide a shelter and make sure that these animals are safe and clean. And in fact, dads are so involved in the species that they do everything that moms do, except for nurse the pups. And so my question is, what is the relative role of moms and dads in shaping our behaviors? And specifically, how might this actually differ between boys and girls or sons and daughters? So the first thing I looked at was what's happening in the cells of the brain. So what I did here was took animals that were raised by some by high care parents, some by low care parents, and looked at gene expression or what is happening within the cells in the brain to actually shape behavior. And I found that specifically sons raised by higher care parents actually have increased expression of genes that are related to the way the brain develops. And the next thing I did was look at the structure of the brain, or actually the connections between the neurons, the cells in the brains, and these connections that allow them to communicate. And what I found is that sons are specifically sensitive to care by fathers. So sons raised by high care fathers actually have more of these brain connections in a region of the brain that's really critical for the way they process rewards. And again, there was actually no change in the, in the daughters. And lastly, I looked at social behaviors. What I found, again, was a sex-specific effect, that sons raised by high-care fathers, when they're older, they actually display more parental behavior towards infants. But the opposite is actually true of females, that females raised by higher-care fathers later in life display less parental behavior. And so what I found is that there's a really specific effect of fathers in raising sons, that the, the development of the brain in boys is just really, really sensitive to their father providing these kinds of nurturing cares. And my hope is that by understanding how typical development is different in boys and girls, we might understand why boys are more susceptible to neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD and autism, and why girls are more resilient to these kinds of disorders, but actually more at risk for other kinds of disorders later in life, like depression and anxiety. Thank you. Our next presenter is Su Young Oh, who is finishing up her fourth year in the psychology department where she studies community psychology. Her presentation today is titled, Does Sexual Orientation Matter to Sleep? Have you slept well recently? If you have, that's great. But if you haven't had a good night's sleep in a long time, that could become a serious problem because poor sleep can cause negative physical and mental health problems like diabetes, heart disease, depression, and anxiety. So it is worrying that the growing body of research suggests that sexual minority people have poorer sleep quality and more sleep difficulties than heterosexual people. Yet we don't understand why this is the case. So I wanted to find out why sexual minority people may have poorer sleep than heterosexual people in this research. To be specific, I had two research questions. First, I wanted to see if there was any difference in sleep quality between lesbian, gay, and bisexual, or LGB, and heterosexual young adults 
as other studies have suggested. Second, if we did find a difference, then I wanted to figure out why LGB young adults might not sleep as well. I thought sexual abuse, stress, and depression might be the reasons since these factors have been shown to affect sleep quality and are more common in sexual minority individuals based on the previous studies. To answer these questions, I conducted an online survey with 481 young adults living in the United States. As a result, our study found that LGBT young adults reported worse sleep quality than heterosexual young adults. This was still true even after considering their employment status, marital status, and age. I also found that LGBT young adults experienced more sexual abuse, stress, and depression, which could explain the difference in sleep quality. While we need more research to fully understand why sexual minority people may have poor sleep quality than heterosexual people, our study findings suggest some important ideas to improve sleep quality. One way is to try cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. This therapy could help both sexual minority and heterosexual people sleep better. Also, dealing with sexual abuse, stress, and depression may help improve sleep. By studying this more, I hope that one day everyone can sleep well, no matter their sexual orientation. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Rachel Torriolo, who is in the Department of Chemistry in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, presenting a new method for age prediction for forensic human identification. How many of you are interested in crime TV shows? Now, you know the ones I'm talking about. A jogger is running through the woods and stumbles upon a crime scene. And after the opening credits, you see three very handsomely dressed detectives all standing around a body, and they're saying witty and borderline inappropriate jokes. Those crime TV shows. No matter how heinous the crime, these shows are all sort of comforting, aren't they? Because they always catch the perpetrator by the end of the episode. And usually, it's from a match in a DNA database. But what if I told you that in reality, only about 6% of the US population is represented in that database? And only about 3% of that 6% result in matches, or hits, as we call them in forensics. So what happens to the other 99% of people who are touched by crime? Well, their cases certainly don't get solved by the end of the episode. So this is a picture of me kneeling down to swab blood off the sidewalk from a perpetrator who has left the scene of a crime. Now I'm hoping that I can take this swab back to my lab in Baltimore City and I can get a match in that very same database, but I know that statistically, this is very unlikely. So what's a forensic scientist to do? Well, it turns out we can tell some other things from the DNA, like hair color, skin color, eye color, sex and ancestry, but what about age? We can tell that too but not just from the DNA alone. We have to use something called the epigenome, which is really just a fancy term for all of the chemical modifications that can happen to your DNA as you move through life. And it turns out that as we age, our epigenome ages too. And we can use this information to predict exactly how old someone is. Okay, great. So we figured it out, the detectives love us, and all the scientists are using it, right? They're not. Because this method of analysis is very expensive, labor-intensive, time-consuming, and the sample preparation process results in about 50% of the loss of that DNA, so we can't use it for anything else. So I decided to quit my job as a forensic scientist and pursue this as a line of research for my PhD. Now, four years later, I've developed a device that automates and streamlines sample preparation for forensic human age prediction. The process works for up to five samples, to be processed simultaneously on a device that requires minimal manual user intervention beyond placing a swab at that central chamber in the center of the device. I hope that with my method, we can solve more crimes, we can alleviate some of the burden placed on forensic laboratories worldwide, and we can make reality a little bit more like that fiction we're so comforted by on those TV shows that we love so much.
Okay, last but not least, we have Shannon Savell, who is in her sixth year uh, studying clinical psychology in the Department of Psychology, uh, studying with Dr. Robert Emery. The title of her presentation is Partners, Now Parents, a New Teletherapy Intervention Supporting Couples Transitioning to Parenthood. Thank you. Becoming a parent is a highly anticipated milestone for many couples. Yet maybe counter to expectation, previous research suggests that seven out of 10 couples experience a sharp decline in romantic relationship satisfaction, an increase in conflict and distress following the birth of their first child, potentially as a result of strain on the couple's relationship. So it may come as no surprise that half of all relationships that end do so in the first seven years, not too long after the transition to parenthood for many couples. Now setting couples on a positive trajectory from the very start of family formation is critical. However, there are very few interventions that have been developed to strengthen relationships during this time, especially those that are equipped for telehealth to address the very unique stressors for couples expecting their first child during the COVID-19 pandemic. To address these limitations, my advisor and I developed the Partners Now Parents study, in which we had 66 expecting parents to 33 couples from diverse racial and socioeconomic backgrounds who identified as heterosexual, gay, or lesbian. 17 of those couples were assigned to our Partners Now Parents intervention, which includes five sessions delivered via Zoom with groups of two to four couples at a time, in which we provide tools to improve communication and to manage stress and conflict. The other 16 couples were assigned to an active control group in which they received essentially the SparkNotes version of the intervention session content delivered via email, but they did not participate in the session. Now, I'm very excited to share with you all today the participants' reaction to the intervention in an anonymous survey, as well as their reactions in videotaped sessions in their very own words, because we're really interested Did participants find that the intervention helped to heal hearts. So we first asked them, did they find the session useful? And if so, did they enjoy the session? And on a scale of not at all to extremely useful, we found that over 90% or over nine out of 10 of participants found the sessions extremely useful. And again, on a scale of never to always, we found that over 90% of participants found the sessions always enjoyable. Now they invested quite a bit of time in these sessions. So we next wanted to know if they would recommend the intervention to friends and family transitioning to parenthood. And 100% of participants said yes, they would recommend the intervention to loved ones. And in those videotaped sessions, participants noted that the intervention helped them to build community with other expecting parents and to develop skills for ways to manage stress and stay connected as romantic partners and as co-parents. So, okay, we had very positive reactions to this intervention, but you may be wondering what happened to the romantic satisfaction. Well, over the course of the transition of parenthood, we found that for people in our intervention, there was a less steep decline in romantic satisfaction than those in the active control group. So in conclusion, the Partners Now Parents study provides important data on one new scalable way delivered via telehealth from OBGYN and family medicine clinics to help set families on a positive trajectory from the start of their family formation, potentially reducing mental health burden for new families. Thank you. Sam and I have had the great pleasure of working with all of today's finalists over the past few months as part of the PhD Plus preparation series and throughout the preliminary round of the competition. We got to see firsthand the huge amount of work that goes into distilling years of research into three short minutes. And needless to say, the preliminary judges had a really hard job narrowing it down to these eight. And our finalist judges are going to have a similarly difficult job choosing the winners today. Uh, so with that, we're going to dismiss the judges to deliberate. We have about half an hour for them to have that conversation. And in the meantime, we have a reception back here for all of us to spend some time and, and talk to mingle with the presenters and enjoy some beverages and snacks. Uh, and then we'll reconvene in 30 minutes to share the results and winners. Uh, but we need your help with one of the awards, with the Audience Choice Award. So in the program that you have, you should have an Audience Choice ballot. If you could select one person, your favorite, and submit your ballot to the box on the table behind me, that would be great. <laughs> uh, and we'd like you to do that on your way to the reception so that we have, um, we have all of those to count in time for the award announcement. Uh, the winner of the Audience Choice Award will receive a prize of $500, so choose well. <laughs>
Okay, so with that, we'll reconvene in 30 minutes. There's pens on the table if you need them, uh, but otherwise, judges, good luck. <laughs>
of the moment I know you've all been waiting for because you voted in it, our Audience Choice Award. So the one that was selected by you for our $500 prize as well as bragging rights for Audience Choice Award is Rachel Pajelio. You get to come back up. We have an earned certificate for you. <laughs> Last but not least, our first place prize, uh, which comes with $1,000 in award money for this year's 2023 Graduate Thesis Slam. And our winner for first place is Abigail Graham. And additionally, if we could have one big round of applause for all of our presenters at this year's competition. You all did amazing. We really thoroughly enjoyed working with all of you over the past several months. It's been amazing to see how these presentations began, continue to really kind of expand and, and even be more powerful in the ways you're presenting them, the way your stories were crafted. And it was a lot of fun to work with you. We'd also like to thank our judges, our finalist judges who came in and joined us today from as far away as Phil said, Atlanta <laughs> and Washington, DC. Ansley, Amy, Roz, and John, thank you so much. I know how hard that decision was back in the conference room and really trying to figure out exactly the order because these were all so great. Ansel even said as we were getting ready to leave the stage that this is gonna be really hard, and it was. <laughs> um, we'd also like to thank our 19 UVA colleagues that participated in six preliminary session rounds that helped us kind of refine the field and selected the ones that would be participating this week in the finals. So thank you all. And with that, we'd also like to thank our colleagues in the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Affairs. This event, to run as smoothly as it did, it takes an entire office. There's only three of us currently on stage. Um, this would not have happened without a few people that are in the crowd, but also not here today. Um, so if we could get one big round of applause for Amy Guru, Maori Neal, Jasmine Crenshaw, and Robin Silva, because they also made this happen. Thank you. So we look forward to seeing you again next year, hopefully back here in Alumni Hall for our 2024 Graduate Thesis Slam. And do we have any other closing remarks? Kelly, Phil, would you like to share? Our reception will continue until six o'clock. I'm sure there's still some food. There's definitely some time to mix and mingle. Hope you will join us, congratulate all of our winners and get to talk a little bit more to the judges since we kept them in a conference room for the last 35 minutes. Thank you all for coming.